Hello Booktube, my name is Sarah and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm coming to you with my August 2017 wrap up. So this might be a longer than, you know, usual video, but that is pretty normal for my wrap ups because they tend to be a little bit longer because I like to talk about all the books. So we'll start off with my stats for the month of August. I read a total of 21 books. This is by far the best month I've had. Last month it was only 20, this was 21. Now to be fair, three of these books were novellas and I think five of them were Babysitter's Club books. So it's not like every single book was like a 400 page adult novel. But still, I read 21 books this month. Um, according to Goodreads, I am six books ahead of schedule and I up my Goodreads goal to 170 from 160 and I'm still six books ahead of schedule. So I might have to up that again um, or just leave it as it is and just see how many books I finish this year and then, you know, do my, um, for next year when I do my 2018, you know, goals, um, put that into effect and, you know, look at how many books I finished this year and stuff like that. Anyway, um, I read two five-star books, one a four-and-a-half star book, four four-star books, six three-and-a-half star books, seven three-star books, and one two-and-a-half star book. I read nine romance novels, six fiction, two historical fiction, two romantic suspense, one historical romance, and a cozy mystery. I read 14 adult novels, six middle grade novels, and one new adult. I read one book published in the 1960s, six published in the 1980s, four published in the 2000s, eight published between 2010 and 2016, and two that were published this year in 2017. I read 13 audio or 13 ebooks and eight audiobooks. That audiobook number is a lot higher than it's been previous months, and it's going to be even higher um, in September um, because that's primarily where I'm doing my reading right now because that's what I seem to be gravitating towards and what I seem to be enjoying. So I'm just going to go with it. Um, I read 18 novels and three novellas. Grand total of 4,897 pages, which works out to about 157 pages a day. Um, my year-to-date page count is 33,703 pages. That's craziness. Um, so, as per usual, I'm going to jump in and just quickly talk about my Babysitter's Club books that I read this month. So, the first one was book number six, which is Christie's Big Day. I gave that book three stars. It is the story of Christie's mother is remarrying um, Watson, and Christie and the other four babysitters are hired to look after 14 children that will be at the wedding in the week leading up to the wedding so all the adults can kind of do wedding preparations. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a cute little story. Um, book number seven, Claudia and Mean Janine, I also gave three stars to. This is about Claudia trying to get, um, you know, have a relationship with her older sister who is a genius and she's very difficult to talk to. Also in this book, um, Claudia's grandmother suffers from a stroke. So yeah, another good one. Book number eight, Boy Crazy Stacy. I gave this book four stars. This one was always a favorite of mine. Um, it takes place in the summertime at the Jersey Shore, like in that area, um, an area called Sea City, which very much reminds me of where I used to spend my summer vacations as a kid. And Stacy and Marianne are hired by the Pikes to look after all eight kids during this two-week vacation, so they spend it as mother help, mother's helpers on the beach. And I really adored this story. Um, book number nine, The Ghost at Dawn's House. I gave this book three and a half stars. Really cute. Dawn finds a secret passageway that leads from the barn to her house, like actually to her room, and they think there's a ghost, and hijinks ensue. Really cute story. Um, book number ten, Logan Likes Marianne. I gave this book three stars. Um, this one, uh, Marianne is the shyest and the quietest and the youngest, actually, in birth date of all the babysitters, and um, she's the first to have a steady boyfriend. So this is the book where Logan and Marianne meet, and you get introduced to Logan, who ends up being um, becoming a um, an alternate office, not an alternate officer, an associate member of the Babysitter's Club. Really cute. Um, and last but not least, Christy and the Snobs. I gave this book 3.5 stars. It was book number 11. This one was a difficult one for me to read in a way, because in this story, Christy's in her new neighborhood. It's a very wealthy neighborhood, and there's snobs evidently and um her old dog louie who is a collie in this book he passes away um and in light of what happened earlier in august with us losing our cat it was kind of poignant in a way and i did cry a bit in this book when i was reading it um 
when they got to the scene of, of Louis of Louis having to be put down, and it, it was heartbreaking, um, just because it was still so fresh for me personally. And yeah, so those were all the Babysitter's Club books that I read this month. So as per usual, I like to talk about all my other books from least favorite to most favorite. So there are a bunch of them. Let's jump in and get started. The first book that I, um, or the first book on this list is Winter's Camp by Jody Thomas. I gave this book two and a half stars. It has an average rating on Goodreads of 4.02 stars, so I am obviously in the minority on this one. I gave it three hearts, and as I talked about in a previous video, um, I will leave um, a link in the, dis or not a link, but um, a little description in the um, description box below on what all the heart ratings mean in terms of love scenes in these books. Um, it was published in 2015, and it is um, book number 0 0.5 in the Ransom Canyon series. It's the prequel, so it's only a novella. This was an interesting story, but it didn't blow me away by any stretch of the imagination. What I did really like about it is that the Ransom Canyon series is a contemporary romance series by Jody Thomas. This book as the prequel was actually a historical novel, and it's about like one of the main characters from the first book's great, great, great times, whatever, grandfather, um, you know, arriving in this area, I believe Ransom Canyon's in Texas, and, you know, he ends up saving this girl who was taken by a tribe and held, like, you know, as a slave kind of idea, and their relationship, and then he ends up marrying her and all these things. Um, you know, it was, it was an interesting little story, but it was really nothing that blew me away. I had picked Ransom Canyon to read this month for my, t or to read in August on my TBR. Didn't realize that there was a prequel. So I was about a chapter into Ransom Canyon when I kind of looked and went, oh goodness. So when I had bought this book, read it, and then went back and finished up with Ransom Canyon. So speaking of, the next book is Ransom Canyon by Jody Thomas. Uh, I gave this book three stars. It has an average rating of 4.12 stars on Goodreads. This was another book that I considered to have three hearts. And it was also published in 2015, and as I said, it's the first book in the Ransom Canyon series. This one was weird. <laughs> it's the only way I have to describe it. Um, there are three separate storylines in this book. When I picked this up, I, I expected a contemporary cowboy romance kind of book. And yeah, that's in there. Um, that part of it is about a man named, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name. I've read so many books this month, I should really write that down. Um, I know the woman's name was Quinn, and his wife passed away years earlier. Quinn was his wife's best friend. The two of them have kind of had this friends with benefits relationship since, um, not long after the wife's death, kind of consoling each other, if you will. So there was that storyline going on. There was also a storyline about a young girl who is the sheriff's um, daughter. She's in high school, and it's her dealing with some of the boys in high school. And then there was a third storyline about a man who just got out of prison, and the bus dropped him off in this small town, and how he planned on, like, you know, robbing the town blind, essentially, but, you know, kind of has a change of heart. And throughout the entire book, it's like these three random different storylines, but then they all kind of come together at the end, and it makes sense. And, I mean, the characters do interact with each other throughout the story, but it's still very three separate stories. Um, they were, none of them were enough to stand on their own, as far as I was concerned, and I just found it odd. Um, you know, when you're expecting a contemporary romance, but now all of a sudden you're getting, like, a lot of YA angst and this like ex-con it just was a little a little weird for me and I didn't love it as much as I wanted to but I do have more books in this series so I will continue on maybe this one was just a dud the next book is Aaron Under Construction by Marin Thomas uh, I gave this book three stars it has an average rating on Goodreads of 4.13 stars I gave it three hearts um, it was published in 2016, and it is the first book in the McCade Brothers trilogy. This was a cute story about a man who um, kind of has lived a pri privileged life. He has a cushy job that, with his family's company, and his grandfather decides that he needs to become more um, in tune with people and be a little bit more caring and a bit more giving. So he kind of forces him to work for like a Habitat for Humanity type of idea um, in South Central Los Angeles. Um, the lead female character is Latino, and as I mentioned in one of my Friday reads, total bust on the cover with this one, Harlequin. That pretty lady on the cover does not look Latino at all, but c'est la vie. Um, I did enjoy this story. It was a really cute romance between the two of them. It was nice to see him kind of fumbling around, but still wanting to help and do good within the community. I really enjoyed it. There's a great author's note at the beginning of this book um, talking about, you know, the whole um, um, race riots that happened in Los Angeles which was a long time ago. I mean, this book was written in 2016, 
so it's almost nine years old and it was a lot of time before that I mean I'm pretty sure I was in school like public school when it happened um, but yeah it was a cute story um, first in the trilogy I will be continuing on with the next two books next book is coconut iced coffee by Courtney Hunt I gave this book three stars it has an average rating on Goodreads of 4.11 stars um, I gave it three hearts and it was published in 2016. It is book number eight in the Cupid's Coffee Shop series. This is a novella that I'm reading through one book of these every single month for the entire year because each book takes place in a different month. Um, and this one was really fun. The main character, Zoe, that you've known since the very beginning of the series, she's one of the um, ones who run the coffee shop. It's her 21st birthday, and she is um, her cousin and brother. Uh, the other two that she runs the coffee shop with send her to Turtle Island in the Caribbean for her birthday because she's always spent her birthday... Um, on a tropical island even though I never understood why because this book takes place in August why on earth you'd want to go to the Caribbean in August but you know each to their own and of course she starts a relationship with somebody there um, really cute fun story it was such a super quick read I think I read it in like 30 or 40 minutes but enjoyable I do enjoy this series definitely check it out if you're interested next book is Lone Star Surrender by Lisa Renee Jones I gave this book three stars. It has an average rating on Goodreads of 3.55 stars. I gave it four hearts, and this was published in 2009. This book was very steamy. It's a Harlequin Blaze novel. That kind of goes without saying. Um, you know, if I rate a Blaze novel at anything less than four stars, I will be surprised. Um, this one, it was an interesting premise. Um, he, or the late lead female, is a DA, and they are trying to take down some sort of a mob boss. He has been undercover in that organization and, you know, is pretty much been hunting her down to see whether or not she's infiltrated the organization as well. Like, is she part of the organization, but posing as a DA, that kind of thing? And then the two of them end up on the run. Of course, while they're on the run, stuff's going to happen because that's a Blaze novel. And it's another one of those, like, really, do you really think that's an appropriate time to be doing that? Like, you've got hired gunmen after you. You're going to stop to do that? You know, no. Um, but it was really, really well written. Lisa Renee Jones is a great author, and it was filled with a lot of action and a lot of suspense, and I really did enjoy it. Um, again, with some of these more um, steamier books, sometimes when they put these scenes in, I, I have to think, you know, normal people would not be doing that, I don't think. <laughs> but whatever. It was a cute story. I enjoyed it. Next, we have Looking for Salvation at the Dairy Queen by Susan Gregg Gilmore. This was narrated by uh, Tavia... Trivia, Tavia, excuse me, Gilbert. I gave it three and a half stars. This has an average rating of 3.71 stars on Goodreads. It, I gave it one heart, and um, it was published in 2008. A lot of people compared this author to Fanny Flagg. I hate to say it, she's not as good as Fanny Flagg. Um, Fanny Flagg's amazing. But this story was still really, really great. It's about a young girl growing up in, like, I don't want to say rural Georgia, but, um, you know, backcountry Georgia kind of idea very small town and her father is the local preacher and um, her mother died when she was very young and you know growing up she's always wanted to leave it Ringgold is the name of the town she's always wanted to leave and you know finally at the age of 18 she you know packs up her bags and heads to I think it's Savannah and then she realizes like something happened or something bad happens and she has to come back home and it's kind of that you know um, you know, finding yourself kind of story. And it's really, really good, and I really enjoyed it. Um, the narration on it was absolutely fantastic. Um, I thought the narrator did a fabulous job. I really enjoyed this book. Um, it's a lot of backstory into, of course, her life and, you know, her own personal history, like her parents' history and stuff like that. Um, it's also extremely religious, um, which should really kind of go without saying. It's not a Christian novel by any means. Um, at least not in the definition of, I think, Christian fiction. But the father's a preacher, and, you know, scripture is talked about, and um, hymns that are sang at church are talked about quite often. And actually, um, there are spots in the book where the lead character sings, and the narrator sings, and she's got a lovely voice. It was really, really nice. I do recommend this book if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and definitely I recommend checking it out on audio if you get a chance, because it really, really was a wonderful listen, and I highly, highly enjoyed it. The next book I'm going to talk about is Bet on Us by Rachel Higgles Higginson, I think is her name. This was narrated on audio by Christine Marshall. I gave it three and a half stars. It has an average rating of four stars on Goodreads. I gave it two hearts, and it was published in 2013. It is also the first book in the Bet on Love duology. I looked, there are only two books. 
This was written in 2013, so I don't think there's going to be any more in the series. This is about a girl who is having a very bad day, and, um, you know, she kind of wakes up and goes about her day and then finds out her husband, or her husband, her roommate, because this is, this is a new adult novel that takes place on a college campus, and her roommate has moved out and taken all of her stuff, um, or sold all of her stuff to pay her gambling, like, she has a gambling addiction, she's trying to get into, like, gamblers, like, anonymous or something, and then anyway, this man shows up, um, or boy or whatever, shows up in her apartment demanding $7,000 that he says he owes her. Well, then she finds out that her roommate stole her identity to enter this, you know, illegal gambling poker thing online, and, you know, the story goes from there. He pretty much hires her. Um, you know, she keeps saying it's not her, it's not her, but because it's not um, an in-person poker game, it's an online poker game, he doesn't know what she looks like. And he kind of hires her to help him, to help pay down some of this debt that she supposedly owes. Well, of course, the two of them end up falling in love. It was a really great story, but I had a few issues with it. One of them was the whole illegal poker gambling thing. Um, so be it. It was a plot point in the story. I thought it was very, very interesting and a really neat um, situation to put the character in. What bothered me is at the end of the book, there were no repercussions. That is major. Like, that is, like, big time illegal. And yet you know, nothing ever came of it, you know, like, as far as I could tell, without trying to give away too much of the plot, it was never disbanded, you know what I mean? Um, the reasons that he, his name is Finn, were doing it were honorable, and, you know, as they usually are, because they don't want to make the person seem like a complete jackass, because, you know, they just want the money. There was an honorable reason why he was doing this to, to, to make money, um, because he was taking a cut of the winnings, which is how he was making money, um, from running the site, but, Again, it's still running, no repercussions, I just, that kind of bothered me. The other thing about the narration was the narrator's voice kind of grated on me a little bit. It was very high-pitched, and when she was speaking for, I think it's Ellie is the main character, it was Eleanor, so um, Ellie was her nickname. It, you know, when she started to get mad, it's like her voice got so high, it was like only dogs could hear it. Um, it was, it was a little hard to listen to at some points. But you kind of got used to it, which is how I find with audio a lot of the times, even if you're not in love with a narrator, you kind of get used to it as you go. But this one, just as a warning, and now I listen to it at a faster speed, so maybe if it was slowed down a bit, it wouldn't be so bad. So just, you know, food for thought. Next book is Montana Vet by Anne Rolfe. Um, I gave this book three and a half stars. It has an average rating of 3.82 stars on Goodreads. I gave it three hearts. It was published in 2015, and it is book number three in the Prosperity Montana series. This was our um, August uh, 2017 Novel Expectations Book Club book pick. Say that three times fast. Um, and I did do a full review on this book, so if you're interested, I'm linking it, or I'll have it linked in the description box below. I already recorded it, and it went up a couple days ago, so please go ahead and check that out. Um, after that comes Crimson Twilight by Heather Graham. This was narrated on audio by Paul Bomer. I gave it three and a half stars. It has an average rating of 4.06 stars on Goodreads. I gave this book two hearts. It was published in 2014, and it is book number 11.5 in the Crew of Hunters series. So, of course, this comes between books um, 11 and book 12. And when I saw that there was a novella, I immediately picked it up, and then I realized that it was also on audio. And because it was only a novella and I already owned the Kindle copy, I was able to pick it up for like two bucks for the audio. The audio is about three hours long, so I mean it was a decent length audiobook. Didn't love the narration so much, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, the story was really cute. It was two of the characters from previous books, and they are at this like what seems like a medieval castle in New England that the owner brought over like brick by brick many, many years ago, like generations ago, to be rebuilt. And they decide they want to get married here. Well, the day of their wedding, the minister's found dead. And then the story kind of goes from there. It was a really, really great story. It was a lot of fun. Like I said, the, the, the audio was only three hours long. It's, I believe, a hundred and some odd page ebook if you're going to read it. Um, like I said, I was not thrilled with the narration. Um, I, I don't know what it was. It, it, those of you who listen to audiobooks, you might get this, that there are certain narrators that aren't that bad, but there are certain words that they say that grate on you. And when you hear that word a lot, you, you, it, it almost over, over um, exemplifies it. Do you know what I mean? Like in this, in this narrator's case, it was the way he said the word eyes. 
And every time he said the word eyes, it just I kind of went, That's, you're not saying it right. You know what I mean? But say la vie. It was only a novella, and he is not the normal narrator for the Crew of Hunters books, of which I'm forever grateful, um, because I don't know if I could continue listening to them on audio if he did them all. It wasn't a horrible job. Again, there were just certain words and certain phrases that he said that kind of got on my nerves, and unfortunately they were words and phrases that were said quite often. <laughs> the next book is The Cat Who Ate Danish Modern by Lillian Jackson Braun. I gave this book four stars. It has an average rating of 3.9 stars on Goodreads. This was given zero hearts. It was published originally in 1967. Please keep that in mind for when I talk about this. This is book number two in the Cat Who Mystery series. This was a cozy mystery, and again, it was published in 1967. I was reading the reviews afterward on Goodreads that some other people had rated it, and a lot of people were complaining about the way that women were portrayed in this book. This is written by a woman, but it's written in the late 19 or in, yeah in the late 1960s. People's perceptions have changed since then on the way, you know, women are discussed, and you know, like pretty much it was the way that because the the lead, the lead character in this book is a man, and it's about a man and his two cats who solve mysteries. And this man's a reporter. Um, I believe it's in Chicago is where this takes place. I don't know if the big city's ever named, but I think it's implied that it's Chicago or something like that. And he's been given this new beat, essentially, and it is doing the um, the interior decorating, this interior decorating magazine for that's going to be a supplement every week in this newspaper. And, you know, of course, he's got the women's department are quite upset that he got this job and they didn't. And, you know, sometimes some of the ways that women are talked about and described are less than what we would now. You know, like, times have changed. It's been a long time. It's been, what, 50 years almost? Um, and the other thing is, too, is some of the ways that minorities are talked about. Um, they reference a Chinaman quite often, you know. And nowadays, if you wrote that, you know, it's not, um, it's not politically correct, essentially. But again, for the time period, it was. Um, and... I don't think you can fault the story for that because it's still a really cute whodunit. I kind of knew who it was, like you kind of figured it out, it's not a really difficult thing to figure out, but it was still a lot of fun and I mean I just wanted to address that because I find that that is such a big thing now with this whole, and I'm all for being politically correct, you know, like I, everybody is equal in my opinion, I don't care what color skin you are, what religion you believe in, who you want to have a relationship with, that's your business, as long as you're not hurting anybody else. But I think we've got to, you know, we can't judge these books that are older based on that same criteria because it's a different time period. And maybe that's just me, but I'm just saying. So outside of that, this is a really great series. It's one of my favorite series, and I absolutely recommend that you guys check it out. Of course, this is the second book. So Coco's the only cat in this one, but Yum Yum comes in towards the end, which is the second cat. And then from there, it's both cats in all the books. So yes, I really did enjoy this one. Next book is The Cursed by Heather Graham. This was narrated on audio by Luke Daniels. I gave it four stars. It has an average rating on Goodreads of 4.03 stars. This was given three hearts. It was published in 2014, and it is book number 12 in the Crew of Hunters series. This book takes place in South Florida in Key West, and that alone made me super excited because it's one of those bucket list places that I've always wanted to visit. So it's about a woman who runs a bed and breakfast, and a man is murdered right in her back alleyway. And um, he's essentially was FBI, and he infiltrated this mafia gang and trying to take it down from the inside kind of idea. So they're trying to find out who done it. And this mafia gang or whatever they are, they are looking for this treasure chest. It takes place in Key West. So there's pirates and there's all that, that kind of thing, sunken treasure. And they're trying to find this treasure that, that's worth an, an obscene amount of money. And Hannah, who's the main character in this, who runs the bed and breakfast, she's of course in danger. And um, there's an FBI agent who is going to be helping her. And it's the relationship between two, the two of them as well as this mystery kind of thing that's happening. There's ghosts in the story. There's always ghosts in the Crew of Hunter books. They all um, can um, converse with these ghosts. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed this one. The narration was spot on. I'm Like I said in my little review just a few minutes ago, I'm so happy it's this narrator doing these books and not the, the one who did the novella because Luke Daniels is, does such a better job, in my opinion. Next up, 
Saints for All Occasions by J. Courtney Sullivan. Um, this was narrated on audio by Susan Denacker. Um, I gave it four stars. It has an average rating on Goodreads of 3.96 stars. This one was given zero hearts, and it was published in 2017. Oh my gosh, guys, this book was so good. This was a historical fiction novel, and it's about two young girls, um, sisters, who come to America. Um, the one sister, the older of the two, is set to marry a local boy. They are from Ireland, and this actually takes place in the 1950s. So it's not that long ago. But I felt like it was something that I had to keep telling myself because this very small town from Ireland that they were from didn't even have electricity. And, you know, pretty, you know, amazing stuff. And the story goes, it's a historical novel again, but it takes place in modern day and goes back. So the modern time aspect follows... I think it's two days, like a 48-hour time period, whereas the historical part follows a narrative that's like 50 years. So it's quite interesting. And the story starts out that the um, lead, lead character finds out that her 50-year-old son, um, because she's older, she's like in her 70s or 80s, that her 50-year-old son was just killed in a car accident. And then the story kind of jumps off from there. And um, uh, to these two sisters coming over to America from Ireland, and, you know, them kind of making their way in America and what happens to the younger sister. You know, again, I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but it is a really, really great story about family and, you know, um, being there for each other and secrets and all those kind of things. And um, my only issue with it, the reason this did not get five stars, because, you know, everything was great. I mean, right up until I love this book. And then it ended like, like that, like it just ended like... It's like the author just said, yeah, I'm done, and put down her pen and walked away. Um, it was so abrupt. You kind of feel, as the reader, that there's stuff left undone. Maybe we're not supposed to know that. Maybe that's the whole point. Um, but it still felt unfinished, and it felt abrupt, and I didn't love that so much. Um, but outside of that, absolutely amazing story. Highly, highly recommend it. And the audio was amazing. Next up. Just the Sexiest Man Alive by Julie James. This was narrated on audio by Karen White. Um, I gave it four and a half stars. It has an average rating on Goodreads of 3.94 stars. I gave it two hearts, and it was published in 2008. I owned this book years ago. I remember having a copy of it in like paperback, like mass market paperback. And when I did my purge of all my physical books, this obviously was one of the ones that went. Well, I actually had a different book pick. This was for my Triple RC Challenge for the, you know, read a book by a member that joined in August of any year. And the book I originally had picked was um, Witches of New York by Amy McKay. And unfortunately, my ebook reading in the month of August kind of went right downhill. So I wanted to find something on audio that I could listen to. So I went back over the lists again of people who joined in September of any year. And I had just bought this book as an ebook. Um, in a Kindle Daily Deal for like 99 cents. So anyway, I it, it was fresh in my mind and I was, I was going through looking at what people had and what we had in common. I saw this book and I'm like, yes, I've wanted to read that thing for years because I owned it years ago. So I ended up going on my library's website and lo and behold, they have the audio available. So thank you very much. So I listened to it on audio, obviously, and gosh, guys, this story was so good. Um, it is about a woman named Taylor and she's a district attorney and she works for a large firm in Chicago. Well, she's been sent to Los Angeles um, to work on another case involving sexual discrimination in the workplace. And Jason is your lead male character. He is literally just been labeled Sexiest Man Alive by People Magazine. He's a high paid actor. He is well known to everyone. He does like these action kind of things. In a way, because he's not my favorite actor, I want to say the description reminds me a bit of Tom Cruise, like that whole Mission Impossible kind of guy, but can also do these romantic comedies. That's, in my head, the kind of career path that this guy had. Not the same personality. Not like that. But just the career path. Anyway, Taylor, as part of her um, duties, she's been asked to coach Jason um, in being a lawyer because his next movie is going to be a legal thriller and he's playing a lawyer. So she kind of balks at it at first and doesn't want to do it. She thinks she's too important. You know, she's a high powered paid lawyer. She doesn't want to be babysitting some stuck up movie star. So the relationship goes from there. I loved, loved, loved 
all the characters in this book. Um, Taylor was amazing. Um, her and Jason, the dialogue between the two of them was so witty and so on point. Um, Jerem or Jason has a best friend named Jeremy, and he's a um, a film like a scriptwriter. And when they described him, what I could think for those of you who might know who this is, I'm about to talk about. He reminds me of um, Silent Bob, or um, oh my gosh, Kevin Smith. If you guys are familiar with Kevin Smith, all the movies that he does, that's who he kind of reminded me of, like this like little sidekick to this you know, big important movie star. Um, even towards the end of this book when, um, you know, uh, they were kind of figuring out the relationship and all that, because it is a happily ever after, um, Jason was still partially that self-absorbed, very important movie star. And he didn't completely lose that persona, and I really, really liked that they didn't make him have an about face and become something that he wasn't at the beginning of the book. Now, you'll notice, look at the cover, look at the title of this book. I only gave it two hearts. This book was like, had tension in it, but there were no love scenes until the very, very end. Again, I don't want to give too much away. And they were tame. Like, I thought going into this, this was going to be a really steamy book, but it wasn't. And you know what? It was kind of a delightful surprise, and I really enjoyed that, that they didn't need that aspect in order to have this relationship. And as usual, Karen White, bang up job on the audio. I loved it. All right, my second favorite book of the month. Now, this book and the one that won top spot, if you will, could be interchangeable. The more I sit back and think about it, either one of these books could have made the very top of the list. So let's just call it a tie. Um, Lost and Found Sisters by Jill Shalvis. Um, this was narrated on audio, again, by Karen White. Um, this was, I gave this book five stars. It has an average rating of 4.2 stars on Goodreads. I gave it three hearts. It was published in 2017 and it is the first book in the Wildstone series. Oh my gosh, guys. This book was so good. I bought it when it came out on ebook. I had it on pre-order. And when it got added to my TBR for August, I immediately went and looked for the audiobook and it was available at a reduced price, of course, on Audible because I've already got the ebook. And this was the story of a woman who, um, her name is Quinn, she finds out she's adopted. So in her mind, her whole life has kind of been a lie. And she gets this letter from her mother, her birth mother who had passed away, to come back to this small town in Northern California called Wildstone. And the town has like, you know, she has a hard time getting Wi-Fi, um, there are no pizza, like drive through places. You know, there's this old cafe that her mother ran that she, you know, has kind of inherited it as well. And she finds out she's got a younger sister um, named Tilly. And at the beginning of every chapter, now Tilly's young, I think she's like 15 or 16. Beginning of every chapter, you get this kind of like little poignant like saying that are from the mixed up files of Tilly's journal, which is really adorable. And I love how every chapter started that way. This story was a bit of a departure for the normal Jill Chavez book, which is about a relationship between a man and a woman, typically. This one was about the relationship between the sisters, and how Quinn is coming to terms with the death of her birth mother, who she never even knew, coming to terms with now that she has this sister, um, and there's a whole backstory with her, well, adopted sister, who she always thought was her sister, along with her adoptive parents and her life back in Los Angeles. Um, and then also, you know, as a secondary to all of that is a relationship with this man whom she has met and fallen for. And it is a wonderful, wonderful book. Karen White did a brilliant job narrating this, narrating this as far as I'm concerned. She's narrated a lot of books. I have a feeling that she is going to be like my top narrator of the year. It just so happens with the books I'm listening to. Um, but in certain books, she's different. Like, she can really kind of change that at first you're like, is that really her? Um, and then you realize, yeah, it is. Two of the characters in this book, um, friends of Quinn's birth mother, um, is a German woman and a woman from the islands. I cannot remember where she's from in the Caribbean. I don't want to say in case I get it wrong. But Karen White does accents for both of them and does a brilliant job. Um, my only, only complaint about this book, if I had to have one, is the fact that book number two is not due until next summer. So I am totally bummed about that. But definitely, as soon as it's available for pre-order, I'll be pre-ordering the heck out of that book. I adored this, and it was so, so good. If you like Jill Shalvis, but the love scenes and that that aspect of it kind of make you shy away just a little bit, try this one, please. 
There are some love scenes in this book, but they are not the typical that Jill Shalvis is known for. Um, but yeah, absolutely could not recommend this book highly enough. And last but not least, the second book that came in a tie for top book of the month was The Best Man by Kristen Higgins. Um, this was narrated on audio by Amy Rubinate. Um, I gave it five stars. It has an average rating of 3.93 stars on Goodreads. I gave it three hearts. It was published in 2013 and is the first book in the Blue Heron series. This book is a reread for me. I've read it twice on ebook. This is the first time on audio. And guys, you know my fangirl love of Kristen Higgins. This woman just makes me unbelievably happy. And in the month of August, it was so funny because um, I was following somebody on Twitter, I can't remember, but this person asked, um, were there any, you know, could they recommend any um, audiobooks that were um, funny, like humorous, romantic comedy type audiobooks. And I just wrote below, I put anything by, and then I tagged at Kristen Higgins. Because really, her stuff is very much a romantic comedy kind of idea. Kristen Higgins liked my comment. I fangirl like you won't believe. I called my mother to tell her. She just liked the comment, that's all, and I was so excited. I know, I'm a geek, and I don't care. This book is the story of Faith and Levi. Um, this book can tug at your heartstrings, and there's a scene in this book that actually almost had me in tears. To read it is one thing, to have it narrated is completely different, I felt anyway. So Levi, or Levi, Faith was essentially left at the altar in a way. Um, she's there to get married, um, Jeremy was her boyfriend, and Levi was the best man, um, Jeremy's best, best friend and best man at the wedding. The whole time, Levi has known that Jeremy was gay. Um, Jeremy himself didn't even want to admit it. This all happens at the very beginning of the book, so I'm not giving anything away. And then so essentially, they don't get married. And Faith blames Levi. You know, in the back of her mind, she knows this would have been a horrible mistake to make, but still can't help blaming him for the life that she had planned. So she ends up taking off to San Francisco after the wedding, and she's away for years and years, finally comes back to town, and she's there for a few months, and of course, things start up in classic Kristen Higgins fashion. This goes back and forth between the past and the present, um, because Levi and Faith have known each other since they were little kids. He's from the wrong side of the tracks, like the trailer park, and she lives up on the hill. Her family owns the winery, that kind of thing. Um, but it shows how their relationship developed, even when they were younger, before she met Jeremy, and he kind of swooped in and became her prince, you know what I mean, on a white horse. And Faith has like a very heartbreaking backstory as well because her mother died when she was, I think like, I want to say like 10 or 12. She was young, but not too, too young. And she was in the car. Um, it was a car accident and Faith was in the car. And the scene that I'm talking about that kind of really, really um, is very well written. Um, and it's the way it was written is that she was stuck in this car with her mother who had died after the accident. The car had rolled. So they were on a country road somewhere and it took time of course for people to a notice that there was an accident and b for help to arrive and the scene is written in such a way that um, faith can still see the clock on the dashboard um, and it's still running like the clock is still working and it goes through it's like 45 minutes so and so arrives and finds us you know 55 minutes the police show up and the way it's written and how long of a time she spent in that car with her mother and it's just, and it gives me goosebumps now just thinking about it. It was, it was so well done and so well written. Um, but outside of that sad, sad part, I mean, there were a lot of poignant parts in this book that just tugged at your heartstrings. But there were some really funny parts. And the, some of the characters are just a hoot. Colleen, which is um, Faith's best friend, she's trying to pick up, like, a geriatric older man. She wants, like, you know, a sugar daddy kind of idea. Um, Faith's grandparents are just a hoot. Um, they pretend that they can't stand each other, and I think some parts of it, you know, like you kind of learn about their backstory too, and you know, the reason why they married, and not necessarily that they hate each other, but do they think they made the wrong decision after 60 years of marriage? And there's a great quote that I saved, um, because I've read this book a couple years ago, and it was still kind of listed on Goodreads that I had read it, um, some of the stuff that I had saved from reading the ebook version of it, and there's this great quote about the grandparents, and I just had to read it to you guys, it says, should you lie about stuff like that, he asked. Levi was well acquainted with the Elder Hollands, as they made up about 10% of his work week. 
And if Mr. Holland really was under the weather, he'd bet Mrs. Holland would be picking out his funeral clothes and planning a cruise. I mean, they just fight constantly, and it's hysterical. So Levi is the local chief of police, and, you know, their first meeting back in the book between him and Faith is he pulls her over to give her a speeding ticket. Fantastically great book. I could not recommend this author enough. I still say my favorite Kristen Higgins is still um, just one of the guys. But this one runs a very, very close second. Again, I've read it three times, and I think every single time I read it, I love it just a little bit more. Amy Rubinate did a great job with narration, in my opinion. I really enjoyed it, and again, I cannot recommend this book enough. So anyway, guys, that is it for my wrap-up. I'm sorry if it was super-duper long. Um, originally, what I was trying to do before and months previous was like just give a really detailed description of my favorite books, but then I came to a realization. Maybe there's some really great reasons why I didn't like a certain book or things I didn't like. I shouldn't gloss over that. Maybe I should let you guys know because it may you may be like, well, I really like that in a book, so I think I'll check that out. Or, you know what, maybe I don't like that so much. So I like to give you guys as much information as possible. But anyway, as per usual, there will be links in the description box below to all of the books that I mentioned along with all of their star and heart ratings in case you guys are curious and you missed anything. So please also let me know in the comments below what books you read in the month of August and what was your favorite book in August because as you guys know I'm always looking to add other stuff to my TBR. Anyway guys until my next video take care and happy reading. Thanks for watching. Bye.